your place of belonging. You are his. Well, we're so glad you could be here with us again. If you're visiting us, we're so glad you could come share this time with us, intimate time, uh, just being before God. And uh, we're so privileged that you could be here. Just to say there's coffee and tea afterwards. We'd love you to hang around, get to know you better. We just need to mention a couple of things now before we open the Word of God. The first one is uh, to do with the, the gift day. And uh, I think it's the gift day, isn't it? Yeah. These are the four courses that we're giving to as a church. As a church, we do this twice a year. Um, and uh, Phil spoke about it last Sunday brilliantly. Um, please look up what he said, and uh, we're going to talk about it again next Sunday as well, just to give people a chance to really respond to God by faith and see this as an act of real praise to Him. Uh, you know, we come and we worship Him through through our gifts, and we do this twice a year. We don't really talk about money much as a church, but twice a year we say we've got gift day coming, and we give to usually to causes, well, nearly always to causes far beyond ourselves. And so these are the four: the Samaritan Fund, which is really just giving us a chance to give, to give, to give to specific needs that come up uh, around us, and there are many of those. And then there's the North Poru Care Centre, the counselling service. It's so wonderful, really, that some of us have benefited from, and and the whole aim was to set something up in the centre of Poru, uh, free of charge uh, for any who can't afford it. Uh, this is a place where they can be met with as well. It's a wonderful, wonderful service. So we, we're happy to support that. There was a Hope Project, of course, and the booklet that went out and the, the gospel in the booklet, booklet went out to tens of thousands, I think even hundreds of thousands of homes throughout the country. Uh, but there's a cost to that. Well, hey, we want to support that by making that one of our causes. And of course, Kapiti, uh, our, our, our site is up meeting this morning up the coast. And, uh, and, and you know, that's, that isn't free as it were we need to be able to service that and see that get established and grow uh, not so they can just have a church on the coast but that they can be those who are reaching out to those who don't know Jesus and uh, that's really what it's for so these are the, they are the four causes and you've probably got one of these cards in your hand or near you and it's just a pledge card really just so that we can keep track of what comes in and make sure it goes to these four causes so and you may be praying it through still and that's absolutely fine we, and we want you to pray it through we don't want you to just as it were give off the top of your head we want you to pray it through so that what you give is really done for Jesus done for him and for the glory of God and that's really important to us so uh, if you are at that point where you're happy to give and you know what you want to give then fill out the card and put it in the red box by the door and I'll mention it just as we go at the very end as well uh, just to remind you just pop it in the box and uh, just fill out the card both sides, or just be aware of both sides, and then uh, we'll keep track of it. And so it goes through to these four causes. I want to pray for it because it is more than just a, a simple transaction we do. We want it to be an act of our worship to Jesus. So, Father, we do thank you for all that we have. You give us all that we have. You give us, yeah, life itself, breath in our lungs. And, uh, Lord, we want to continue to respond to the grace you give us. We offer up our lives, really, uh, and this is just a small part of our lives, but it's an important part. So we want to give this to you, and we pray, God, help us to give in faith and to reflect your, the generosity of your own heart. And we want these four God, uh, causes to be blessed, and we want souls to be saved through them. We want many to come to Jesus, we want to come to you. So, Father, we pray, help us to give in faith and expectation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we'll bring these again next Sunday for our last opportunity to give. And uh, so it's these Sundays, really. Uh, and we'll remind you again before we close. Just to mention one, other, uh, one or two other things. The next one is a prayer night tonight at 6.30 at the church offices. As, uh, 7.30 is what I said. <laughs> well, in the old time, I'm sure before winter, daylight savings, that's what I meant. 
7.30 tonight. And uh, look, there are just times when, again, we come before God. And principally, why do we do it? Well, we come to meet with him. And that's because we know we need him. We're not so smug that we think we can do this in our own resources. We know we can't. And so this is an opportunity for us to lean on him, reach, uh, to, to reach into the grace that he provides and bring the church before him and hear from him and pray into what we hear. So it's a very prophetic time too. So come, 7.30 tonight at the church offices. Next is uh, Arahanui, I think, and uh, Kapiti. Oh, sorry, McKenna. <laughs> Kapiti, McKenna. McKenna's going to share a little bit about that. Um, it's, I'm really excited to be able to bring Aroha Nui ki te ripeka, um, at the cross on Mother's Day because what a great reminder to honor our women, to support our women, to empower our women. Um, so yep, just making it, making an announcement, Aroha Nui is coming up June 12th um, and then it'll continue into the Sunday morning on June 13th. Um, so I really encourage dads, take the kids, Make, sort everything for the Saturday so that your wife can just go. And it, <laughs> I didn't mean that in a bad way, go, but like <laughs> to be free to go. So um, we're also looking for a couple volunteers. Again, um, men, maybe not the dads, but um, men to help serve and kind of do the hospitality side of things, um, just to further serve the women. And... I don't think that it's not coming to me, so there must not be something else. So, yeah, that's what I've got. We're going to be talking about the cross. Um, and doing communion today was such a great reminder that we never want to get to a point where we're brushing past the cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to remind ourselves the place of our freedom. And, um, yeah, we never want to move on from that. No. We get to move on and that we get to then go forth from the cross. But the cross is so central we can't forget what Jesus did for us on the cross. So. so that's what we're going to be talking about. And it's going to be great. Last year's was great. This year's is going to be great. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Every time they have this conference, it is, it's not just they who meet with God, but we're on the Sunday morning, they then, we, we, we get the overflow of that. And all I can say is they have been the most remarkable moments in our history as a church. So women, please don't miss out on that one. And as a church, we look forward to really receiving the overflow. It is remarkable, remarkable time before God. And I think that really is it. So I just want to welcome uh, our guest speaker this morning. And he is a guest speaker insofar as he's never spoken here before, but he's not a guest at all insofar as he's part of the family. But I respect him hugely. I love his wisdom in the Word of God. Let's welcome Grant, shall we? Go, mate. Am I on? Yep. Thank you, Hannes. Um, I'm just going to get a few things over here because back when I last preached, we had lots of books and things to carry up. Now we have a music stand and my first time on an iPad. <laughs> I've been an Android fan for most of my life. A bit backward, isn't it? Will that be big enough? Oh, I don't think so. More central. Right, so... Wow, that's a different view of the church. <laughs> I, I probably have met most of you, um, but for those of you who I haven't met before, uh, my name's Grant, and uh, I've been coming to King's Church for close on four years. I'm married to uh, uh, Veronique. She's about a 10, I'd say, <laughs> strong 10. But she's not here today. She's, uh, Veronique is a physiotherapist, and uh, she's off on a course. Um, it's something to do with vestibular re rehabilitation, people who are dizzy and need help, right? So that's what she's doing this weekend. Her pronouns are she and where are you? Um, we have two kids, I need help, and the weekend feels really long. <laughs> so um, just, a, just a little bit about us. We moved over here from South Africa about four years ago. We moved to New Zealand, and it's so nice to not feel like someone's going to kill us. Um, this is a great place to live. Right? And despite all the, the challenges that we have and the small concerns we have in the light of COVID, I think it's still probably the best place to be in the world right now. So how I landed up preaching today, uh, Pete came over and visited us and said, Grant, you know, would this, this is something I think that, that you should be doing. And Veronique said, yes, it is. And <laughs> I said, well, 
Okay, I'll give it a go. So I have this long list of concerns. I get emotional when I preach. I do, I choke up a little bit. My cheeks go red. Um, I, I, um, I haven't done this for a number of years. And I, I sort of, um, I, so I detailed this long list to Pete in an email and then I deleted it and I said, yeah, why not? What could go wrong? <laughs> so that's how I landed up here. So I want to walk you through a story. Um, at the moment, we, we are working through the book of Ephesians. We're in, I think, the seventh session. So for those of you who haven't been here, it still amazes me how we open the word of God 2,000 years later and we find things that are so meaningful and real for our lives today. Um, and so we're in the seventh part of, uh, of, this, of this series, and it's in Ephesians chapter 5. Um, and so for those of you who feel like you're walking in halfway through a movie, don't be worried. I'm going to preach almost the whole Bible today. Um, there's a lot of verses in here, um, but, but I don't think you'll walk away um, without understanding what Paul has written. So the first part of what I want to tell you is a story. It's a story about a small town in South Africa in an area called the Karoo. And the Karoo is a dry and dusty place. And it's vast. The landscapes are vast. There's, there's nothing. Um, maybe we could get my first slide up. Let me turn this thing on. Oh, it buzzed. And go. So um, a picture will come up soon. But it's the sort of place that is stunningly beautiful, but the heat is in the 40s. In the summer, it'll draw the life out of you. In the winter, it goes to below freezing. It gets maybe 200 mils of rain in a, in a bad year, so very unlike New Zealand. It's the sort of place where farmers need 54 sheep, sorry, 54 rugby fields to raise a sheep, 54 hectares, one sheep. So the carrying capacity is very low. And so as we zoom into Otur in this town in the Karoo, it's 1780. And we find a Dutch immigrant farmer, and his name is Jacobus van Zeelen, which is a bit of a mouthful, but we can say that in South Africa. <laughs> so in 1780, just to get water to the town, they're bringing it in on, on, a, on a horse and cart and barrels, and they're selling it at six pence a bucket. I'm going to ask Brad just to dim the lights now. This might get a little bit dark, but this is cool. So if there's any crying children, I do have a plan B. If my children come here from Kids Church, I don't have a plan B. That's more of a very neat thing to do. Right, so Jacobus von Zeelen is walking his lands, and he comes across what looks like a small entrance to a sheltered cave. It's really nothing impressive. It's a couple of boulders on top of one another. And as he walks into the cave, he extends his hand, thinking he's, he's going to touch one of the rock faces, but, but he doesn't. So he walks in a little bit further and a bit further. And as he looks behind him, it's just a small tunnel of light. So he, he goes back to his house. He's obviously petrified because he doesn't know what's in there. There's a lot of jackals and things in South Africa. And he comes back with a candle, much like this. And he thinks, well, maybe the candle is enough to see a little bit more of the cave so that he doesn't stumble in the dark. You, see, you might be asking why I'm telling you this story. Without light, we have no idea what might be right in front of us. We might be stepping into a cave that's four kilometers long that took 29 hours to explore on the first expedition. When you're in the dark, you have no awareness of what's around you. You're unable to tell if it's good or bad, if it's beautiful to behold, or if it's something that's going to cause you to stumble. This is what Paul is writing to the Christians in Ephesus. It's the power of light that displaces the darkness. In the historical records, Jacobus had just a small candle. Even the smallest candles gave him just enough light so that he didn't fall down one of the deathly drops in the cave. Imagine the look on his face when he saw what it actually looked like. That's the Kango Caves in Otur and in South Africa. That's what it looks like today. And a lot of tourists go there now, but it stood in the dark for four and a half billion years before Jacobus arrives with his small candle. We have the lights back on. Thank you, Brad. So before I, I start off by burning my hand um, and reading the scripture, I'd just like to pray if we can do that. Lord, we've come to you, Father, because we know you are light. And Lord, as we look at your word, we see the light of the word shining. And Lord, we want to meet with you. Father, we want to know you more. Lord, would, would you open our hearts and would you put a seed in there deep so that we, Father, would walk out of this place knowing you more. Yeah, Father, that we would be drawn to you, the light. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Ephesians 5, verse 8 to 21. I'm just going to turn around to read it because it's a bit bigger up there. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing. Make praise from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's a story of light. And I'm going to track quite closely to my notes today because I struggle to concentrate and I distract myself from myself. So forgive me if it looks like I'm reading a bit, but there's some really important things I want you to hear today. And there's really important detail um, that I think God has put on my heart for today for this moment. So the story of light is woven into the word from the beginning of scripture. It's mentioned over 233 times in the Bible. In fact, a large portion of my message today will be about this light because what Paul writes after the first verse is all written in context of what it means to walk in the light, to live in the light in contrast to the darkness. In the beginning, we see that God speaks his word and there is light. The Jewish people were chosen as a light to the world to reflect the glories of God. The word is referred to as the light. Jesus is referred to as the light. Believers are spoken about as the light of God. So as I did my prep, I'd been asking God, show me, Father, I want to know you more. I want to understand this scripture. And 22 hours of preparation, and I feel like I've just understood the tip of the iceberg. There is so much in the word of God. It's, it's like what Paul said in verse 13 starts to come true. You become illuminated. And, and God interprets his own word with his word. So the more you read scripture, the more and more you understand the depths of what God has preserved in his word. Yes. Over and over, we see this beautiful picture in the Bible. And if this is all you remember today, I think this is enough. The light is coming. The light is here. And you are the light. So let's start with the light is coming. We're told in the Old Testament through a lot of the prophecies, that there was a light coming, that there was a savior and a messiah, that God would send a final redeemer and a king once and for all. John the Baptist comes onto the scene after 400 years of silence. There's no recorded writings after the prophet Malachi where God speaks to his people. 400 years. And then this weird guy rocks up on the scene. There's this long pause between the Old and the New Testament, and then a man who eats locusts and honey in the desert starts proclaiming that a light is here. The light is coming. The light is coming. And the crowds come to him, and he constantly tells them, it's not he. It's not him. It's the Messiah that's coming. You see, John the Baptist was sent for a special mission. He was to preach about repentance to baptize people in water, but also to preach that the kingdom of God was coming and prepare people for the light, the coming of Jesus. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, we see some of this purpose of John the Baptist. So John is recording his gospel and he writes, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, Jesus, so that through him all might believe. True light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. 400 years of silence and the Jewish nation is told the light is coming. Not just any light, but one that gives light to everyone, including Gentiles, including you and me. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus himself makes the same declaration. The light is here. In John 8 verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
John 9 verse 5, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. That really struck me, that verse, because he says, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. There's other verses, John 12, 46. I've come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. And I'll pick up on that again later. John 1 verse 4, in him, in Jesus, was life. And I loved it when Mark mentioned that in worship this morning. What a cool, what a cool school principle. Come on. Hey? Man, I remember school being so different. And you mentioned it this morning, Mark, that if you feel like you have this, this darkness and, and it's broken, that, that there is life and there is light. And I'm like, thank you, Lord, you've confirmed that this exact thing that Jesus said here still takes place t- today. He's the life that was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. He declares himself to be light to the world. He is the source of spiritual light. He's a witness to the truth. His mission was to defeat darkness, to overcome it and conquer death, to be light. So we've seen John the Baptist proclaim and witness that Jesus, the light, is coming. That salvation is near, that truth is on the way. We've seen that Jesus declares himself to be the light. And while he was here, he was the light. But we know that God's plan didn't stop there. Jesus defeated death. He crushed the power of sin and was crucified. And he rose from the dead on the third day. That's why we celebrate Easter. He rose. He now sits at the right hand of the Father. And this is how we arrive at the context of Ephesians. Paul is writing in the New Testament to the church, and there are believers in the church that haven't quite grasped this. Jesus has gone to be with the Father. The Holy Spirit has come to empower the followers of Christ to testify and be light in the world. So let's go back to to verse 8. And this is just the first verse, by the way. This is what I call a rabbit hole. (laughs) Paul makes a statement that I've read a hundred times in my life, and I think it deserves a lot more attention than what we've given it. It says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And I felt that there's no ways I could talk about the light until we understand what it means when he says, you were darkness. You see, there was a man called Adam. I told you I'd preach the whole Bible. (laughs) And because of his disobedience to God, he committed what we call the original sin, the first sin. And sin entered the world because of his representation of all mankind. His offspring, you and me, were subject to the penalty of sin. It was union with Adam and with its sin and penalty that put us in darkness or made us darkness, as Paul calls it. You see, everything, everything that was true for Adam was true for me. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people. Death physically, death spiritually, Separation from God, who is light. It's union with darkness. It's a fallen state that leaves you chasing your desires while you're blind to the dangers that they pose. It's less than one candle in the Kango Caves. You were darkness. This is why all people sin. And some some might say, this seems unfair. I, I wasn't Adam and he doesn't represent me and the choices that I would have made. That God's judgment is too widely cast. But be very careful because... Well, there's another life-giving truth at play. God, in His love and His grace, made the impossible possible. You see, God is very consistent in this truth in that one man can also bring light and life. You see, there was also a man called Jesus. And if our union is in Him, it's radical. The implications are radical. It transforms you from the inside out. The very thing that you are powerless to do when you are in darkness. It may be easy to understand what John the Baptist says when he says Jesus is the light. Because he was God. But what does it mean for me when Paul writes, you are light? Well, we know it's not the same as physical light. Because when I look at my friends around here, you still look like you're not the sun. Right? It's not physical light that he's talking about. But scripture clearly describes believers as light. Back to Ephesians 5 verse 8. I did what Andy Stanley does. Black slides, yellow writing, it'll help you. (laughs) You see, Scripture describes believers as light. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. This is a beautiful or divine exchange. Martin Luther wrote about this. 
quite simply what was true of Adam was true of us, and what is true of Jesus is also true of us. This is what Martin Luther wrote. That is the mystery which is rich in divine grace to sinners, wherein by a wonderful exchange, this is the divine exchange, our sins are no longer ours but Christ's, and the righteousness of Christ, not Christ's but ours. He's emptied himself of his righteousness that he might clothe us with it and fill us with it. And he has taken our evils upon himself that he might deliver us from them. In the same manner as he grieved and suffered in our sins and was confounded, in the same manner we rejoice and we glory in his righteousness. The Bible puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake, he, God, made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, what I'm talking about here is you are light. The very spiritual fabric that makes up believers is changed. You were darkness, and now that you are in Christ, you are illuminated, you are light in the Lord. It's who you're now unified with. It's who you're joined with. It's who you walk with. It's who determines your spiritual DNA. And it's based on an Old Testament sacrificial system. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take the sins of the people and put them on the goat, called the scapegoat, and send them out, cast them out of, out of um, the camp. And it's a beautiful picture of what Jesus has done. So let me remind you what union with Christ is. This, is. this is the base and the foundation for everything else that Paul is going to be saying in the next few verses. You need to understand this because it determines your view on everything else that he says. It's almost like if you had to take... The, the light, the very fabric spiritual light of a believer and put it under a microscope, you might find some of these things. You are now alive in Christ. And I'm not going to put all these scriptures up, but I just, just soak in them because this is, this is the amazing thing that's in God's word. You are now alive in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. It means salvation that overflows, not just for the Jewish people, Romans 5, but the gift is not like the trespass. For, in the, for if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came from his grace, the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? You see, being light means it's not just for the Jews. Ephesians 1, we've been working through Ephesians, talks about how we received every spiritual blessing in Christ. Ephesians 1, 6, the only reason we receive grace and the only way that it flows to a sinner is because we are in Christ. You have been won back. You are free of the captivity of sin. Ephesians 1, 7 says, we have redemption in Christ. We have been purchased by God. We have right standing with God. We have no righteousness apart from Christ. Philippians 3, 9. Galatians 2.20, you are crucified with Christ and it's no longer you that lives, but Christ that lives in you. Colossians 2 verse 12, we are raised with Christ, we have been buried with him in baptism and you have also been raised with him through faith. We have the, present, sorry, we have the peace of God, Romans 5 verse 1. You now have peace with God because we are in Christ. Mm. Ephesians 1 13, we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit because we are in Christ. We are found to be innocent Romans 8 verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You cannot be condemned. There's a beautiful description that Jesus gives in the Gospels. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches and apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, a branch cannot su survive on a dead vine. And I think sometimes we view eternity with God as a, as a gift or a token that we get at the end of our lives. But the implication here is that you are alive because he is alive. It's a function of the resurrection of Christ. It's not a gift. It's because you are in him. You are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. Does that give you an idea of what it could mean to be the light? You see, everything that we were became Christ's. Our sin, our punishment, our darkness, our separation. Everything that Christ is becomes ours. Our right standing with God. We are justified because he is justified. Our sins are washed away. We are alive and we are empowered by the spirit of God. You are free from the chains of sin. You have eternity with the Father because you are in Christ. From death to life. From darkness to light. None of it deserved. None of it earned. And it's offered even to the very worst of us. And it's always free. You are vastly different to the darkness that you used to be. Yes. This is what Paul is writing. 
So you're ready to get past the first verse? <laughs> right. See, the rest of the passage is telling us what it looks like to live as children of the light. You walk in a way that reflects your new DNA and your union with Christ. But sadly, Paul says there's some of us that still love darkness. And there's some heavy things coming. But I want you to hear it because I want to preach the whole of that scripture and not just the top bit. In the Gospel of John, it says the light had come into the world, but men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And that word love really hit me. Because it's not just that you stumble and maybe do something. It's that you love it. You see, there's a deep issue in the church of Ephesus. And I, I think I could suggest that it's not too different to the modern church. The world really does love darkness. And when you love something more than God, you land up in sin. We could read Paul's warnings and that would be 100% relevant for today. I've highlighted them for you. Paul writes, have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. It's shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. Be careful how you live, not as unwise. The days are evil. Don't be foolish. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, <coughs> excessive indulgence in your sin. See, Paul's not just writing a checklist of do's and don'ts. This is a very real warning of what's in the depths of the cave. You won't recognize it. You'll stumble. And even worse, you'll probably love it. You'll probably love it more than him. So Andy Stanley, I mentioned him before, he's one of my favorite preachers. And he's, he says in one of his series, sin's got a gotcha and it's going to get you. You see, teasing sin never ends well. Sin's got a gotcha and it's going to get you. 1 Peter 5.8, be sober-minded and alert your adversary. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. If sin is left in darkness, if it's hidden and you don't resist it, you will pay a price. It always costs you. It always devours. It always leaves you dead. Death to your finances, death to your marriages, death to relationships in your family, obsessed, consumed and addicted. Paul talks about people who are caught up in meaningless and fruitless deeds of darkness. Sins that are powerfully destructive and kept away from the light. And we're not too different from that church 2,000 years ago. The numbers are staggering. I work for a company in analytics, so numbers mean things to me. And I think that they, they give us a stark reality, a reality check. In 2020, the global pornography market was worth $97 billion. And that's only with the paid for services. It's growing at an alarming rate. People pursue their desires. They stumble around in the dark and they play on the edge of a massive cliff. They don't even have a clue that they'll pay a price for it. Almost every person, close on 90% of males and 55% of females under the age of 24 in the developed world would have been exposed to pornography before um, 24 years old. 88% of pornography contains violence towards women and it's in stark contrast to the love that should be a mark of someone who follows Christ. The fruit of light, Paul reminds us, is goodness and righteousness and truth. And 100% of this falls into the category of dark. Paul instructs us to bring it into the light because you are children of the light and you are light. Why? Why does Paul say this? It's going to stop you from loving God. That's why. Your love for God is much more important than these fruitless deeds. Here's some other, some other stats which I find quite shocking. The average teen in the developed world would spend around about nine hours a day on social media and entertainment like video streaming. In a lifetime, if you make it to 72 years old, which most of us should exceed, the study predicts the average person would have spent six years and eight months of their life just on social media. Forget Netflix. I'm not saying social media is all bad. I'm saying six years and eight months could be a problem, right? I'm on social media groups. One of them is the AOT, a community group, where 40% of the messages are about a missing cat. <laughs> and the other 40% about it being found. You see, your influence has a massive effect on what you're feeding yourself. We feed ourselves social media and expose ourselves to every imaginable thing and we pay a price. And most of the time, it's at the expense of the word. See, as a child of light, the word is light. The word is a lamp for your feet and a light to your path. Biblical illiteracy in developed world countries is spiraling. 
There was a study by the Borough Research Group that said less than half of adults can now name four Gospels. The four Gospels. As many, uh, many Christians will only name, know the names of two to three disciples. 60% of people only know five commandments. 82% believe that God helps those who help themselves is in the Bible. And it's not. There's 12% of you who probably knew that. Hold on. 18%. 81% of Christians believe that the main reason for your life is to take care of your family. That's a very good reason. But is it the main reason? Why has God made you? 12% believe that Joan of Arc is Noah's wife. <laughs> Mrs. Arc. And over half of high school graduates believe that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. You see, we shield our lives from the word, our conversations are stripped of biblical references, and we pay a price when we live apart from the light. We are now confused about our purpose. One of the major indicators of teen suicide is purpose. <coughs> We are confused about our understanding of human sexuality and marriage because we don't have the light of the Word of God. We have Facebook, we have Twitter, Instagram, and we have games to play. And to top it all off, just like in Ephesus, I think we have a massive binge drinking culture. Paul says, don't get drunk on wine, it leads to debauchery. We cave to our carnal desires and we love darkness. He says, make the most of every opportunity. And I know this is a heavy word, but still asking God after 22 hours, should I preach it? I felt I should. So what do we do? Paul's got a number of things. I've highlighted them in the text for you as well, just like Andy Stanley. He says, you are light. Verse 10, find out what pleases him. Wake up, sleeper. Be careful how you live, not as unwise. Understand the Lord's will and be filled with the Spirit and always give thanks to God and submit to one another. So there's a number of things that Paul says that we ought to do in contrast to living in the darkness. So how do we find out what pleases him? How well do you know him? Here's a question. Does Jacinda Ardern like tea or coffee? Does she shower or bath? Hopefully one of them. We see we just wouldn't know until you know her. You haven't spent time with her. You'd have to read a lot of media releases to try and find out a bit of that. But it's true for us as well. How well do you know God? How do we find out what pleases him? The word is truth, it's light, and it's Jesus himself. <coughs> I found this great um, statement made by Matthew Barrett and the Gospel Coalition. Scripture is the written form of God's special revelation for his people, which provides them with an enduring and permanent witness <coughs> through which the Spirit brings them into union with Christ. It's a special revelation for us, God's people. It will give you an enduring and permanent witness. You see, although Scripture isn't the only revelation of God, it's probably the most consistent and clear. It was breathed out by God through His Spirit and recorded by its authors as God decreed. See, when Paul says, find out what pleases him, this is how. The Bible teaches us that the Word of God is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, and it became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The people who walked with Jesus got to know Him because of His physical presence. But to know the Word now is to know Jesus. After all, it is the chief purpose of the world is for God to reveal Himself to us and to reveal Jesus to us. Jesus said, I am the, and the Father are one. If you know the Word, you'll know the Father. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. The more you know his word, the more you know him, and you will know what pleases him. Amen. The other instruction that Paul gave was to be filled with the Spirit, in contrast to walking in darkness. In fact, Paul says to be filled continuously with his presence, with the fullness of the Holy Spirit, if we look at the Greek translation. This is so that you can be light, to testify to the light in a dark world, and so that you would know what pleases Him. It's not only the Holy Spirit that came, but He came to live in us. And the Bible says that as Jesus faced His coming betrayal and the Last Supper with His disciples, this is what we spoke about this, evening, uh, this morning, the hour had come for Him to leave the world. And in John 13 and 14, He says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm leaving, but I'm going to be with the Father and prepare a place for you. And I'll send another advocate to help you, 
and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. I will not leave you as orphans. I will be in you. The spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. As we sat this morning breaking bread, the spirit was confirming that and reminding us of all the things that Jesus had done for us. This is what the spirit does. John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. When Jesus left to be with the Father, we were not left without His presence. If you want to know Jesus, you need to know the Holy Spirit. Being filled means asking the Father daily to fill you with His presence, the power of His Spirit to proclaim His glories to the ends of the earth. It also means time in prayer. You can't have a personal relationship with someone you aren't willing to communicate with. You see, when we pray, we talk to God, and when we read the Word, God talks to us. When you pursue God, you need both. To talk to God and listen to Him speak back. So maybe I could ask the band just to come up. And I'm not done yet, Dali, but I like where you're going. I'll finish. It's 12 o'clock. Coffee and tea is ready. You are light in the Lord. You were created, your purpose was to testify to the truth of God as Jesus testified to the truth. Yes. You were created to declare the glories of God, His great love, His power, His mercy, His grace, so that others would also find Him and enjoy Him. Yes. Paul says, shine in the way that you love one another. Speak to one another in songs and hymns from the Spirit. Encourage one another in Him. Remember, always give thanks to God. Your satisfaction is in Him. Yes. Everything you have is by His hand. Yes. He writes, shine like a light when we submit to one another. Regard one another's needs and serve one another in love. This is in contrast to a world that says, stand up and make yourself heard. The world likes to spend time breaking one another down on social media behind fake profiles. This is not light. You are light because what is true of Jesus is true of you. Live as children of the light. The fruit of the light is goodness and righteousness and truth. So the question I have is, are you dimming the truth of God? Do you navigate the world like a dark cave? Is it just one small candle or no candle at all? Are you occupied with meaningless and fruitless obsessions that Paul writes about? Is there something in the darkness and it's time to bring it to the light? Don't miss the opportunity. If God is speaking to you, He's calling you to know Him. He wants you to be set free. Paul says this is what we ought to do. Sin is not fitting for you. You are in Christ. Light overcomes darkness. Hear Paul's call to repentance. Bring it to the Father. He is rich in mercy. And His love covers a multitude of sins. You see, as you move closer to the light, it's not a, it's not a list of things you do or don't do. It's that you become illuminated. You overcome the darkness as He has overcome the darkness. Jesus said, I've come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If you find yourself in darkness, this is the moment when it can change. Turn. Turn from your sin. He will forgive you and He will make you new. He has come so that no one should stay in darkness. Peter, I don't know um, if you could maybe just close off for us. I feel there's, there's maybe two particular groups of people that, that could hear something in this and I think we spoke about it before. Um, but if you would do that, Peter, if you would just lead us into the end over here. Hallelujah. Just so love what I heard. This is apostolic truth. Can I ask you to stand please? wonderful when the Word of God comes. It comes with the promise of freedom and release. And there may well be just some of us here this morning particularly who feel like I've been in a cave and I don't want to be in a cave anymore. 
And there are things that I've been doing that I don't want anybody else to know. But I know that it's not what God's plan is for me to do. This is an opportunity for transformation. To genuinely leave things behind us that we're ashamed of and walk into light where there is freedom. And so I didn't want to let this opportunity pass when I knew what Grant was going to be saying. So if, if you're there and you know, you know you've been hiding down the back of a cave and you want to be free and you're hearing the promise of the scripture that says you can be light, come into the light, come into what you've called to, leave the cave behind, come out of darkness. If that's you this morning, why would you want to stay in a cave? So let's just take this word very seriously. This is God wanting to set his people or bring his people into greater freedom. Why not respond to that and receive the freedom? So Father, we're standing before you now. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the promise of light. Thank you, Lord. You came to set us free from darkness and the deeds of darkness. You've called us to be children of light indeed. We thank you that's what we are. We want to live in line with that. So Lord God, right now, I pray that by your Spirit, you would meet with us, Lord. Even now, right now, I pray that chains would fall off, folks, this morning. Even as you've been wrestling with things, only you, between you and God, you know what it is. Just bring it before Him right now. I dare you to. Bring it before Him. You know what it is. You know what area of life that you've been struggling with. Whether it's relationships, whether it's dishonesty, whether it's temper, whether it's pornography, whether it's whatever it may be. You know you've been in a compromising situation there. Then I dare you to bring it to God right now in the light of His Word. Bring it to Him. Say, God, I want to turn away from that. Pour out your Spirit upon me. Set me free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of us have been carrying things for years and it's time to let them go in the light of His Word. Some of us have been in a cave of darkness of just depressions, oppressions, Maybe we grew up under it as kids. It's time to let it go. You can let it go. He is light. And Him is no darkness at all. So there are a number of different options this morning. Ways to respond. All of which bring us to transformation and freedom. Maybe there's someone here you've never given your life to Jesus. You may have been coming to church, but you know that you yourself, you've never genuinely submitted your life to Him and said, forgive me for my sins. Come in and make me a child of the light. You can do that right now. He is here by His Spirit. So just where you're standing right now, just bring your life before Him. It's a moment of consecration to his truth come Holy Spirit more we pray we stand before you we love your word come Holy Spirit come and bring freedom release us where the enemy has had a hold on us over the years where maybe for some of us we've almost given up hope that we could ever be free come Holy Spirit release us now told us this morning we can be free so now Lord we receive it in Jesus name hallelujah hallelujah you give life Lord we call out your praise we're going to sing the song just as we close as we sing it just stay before him for one or two of you it will take more than just standing on your own before God you know you will want to in order to be free You'll need to come, as it were, you know, and and just tap us on the shoulder and say, I want to be free of this. Now, Grant's going to wait around the front here. 
some of others of us will do the same. Just come and tap us on the shoulder and say, I, I want to be free. Would you pray with me? And we'd love to pray with you. It would be a privilege for us to pray with you and to agree with you for freedom. It's just a moment in God that it will pass and you'll be having coffee out the back before you know it. But this is a moment of privilege because things can change as we repent and turn to Him and turn away from a life without Him. So make the most of it. Let's sing this song now, shall we? Thank you. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore. that you went to the cross to bring us right through to the house of the Father that we might enjoy what it is to be children of God children who are free transferred totally from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of your dear Son and living accordingly thank you Lord Jesus for that privilege we pray for your ongoing blessing in our lives Lord as we continue to follow you and enjoy the light that you bring 